So if we could time travel back to Shakespeare's time, what would it be like? Later in his career, Shakespeare became part owner of the Globe Theater. And uh, in London, this theater has been built as a replica, more or less what people think, archaeologists believe, the Globe Theater actually looked like. And they actually built it on the south bank of the Thames River, on Southwark, where the theaters were during Shakespeare's time. And if you've ever seen the movie Shakespeare in Love, have any of you ever seen that? Yeah. A couple of you, where you see Shakespeare going back and forth across the river. He's going from London proper over to Southwark. This is where they had, you know, the, the brothels. This is where they had the jail, you know, the clink, Newgate prison. This would be where they had the bear baiting rings. They actually had these rings where you could go and gamble and you know, drink ale and bet on, they'd stake a bear to the middle of a field and, and set the dogs on them and people would gamble. It's a big sport. So if you wanted a prostitute or to go gambling or to go to the theater or to go visit someone in jail, that's Southwark was the, your place to go. You, you know, the theater was seen as sketchy. I mean, let's face it, and, and there's a reason that women were not allowed to perform on the theater on the boards in Shakespeare's day. So yes, R Juliet would have been played by uh, an adolescent boy, as would have all the female parts. It was, the theater isn't a place you would want a woman to be. The actors and people associated with the theater were seen as sketchy. And, but people enjoyed the theater, you know, and it was a place to go see some entertainment and you didn't have to be rich to go, as we'll see. There were private showings of plays. Um, it is said that Macbeth was first performed in front of James I at court. Uh, we know that Elizabeth went, and, well, well, we believe Elizabeth went and, and watched plays. They, they also had a, a more upscale theater in London proper called Blackfriars, which was an indoor theater, torchlit. The Globe, as you can see, was open air theater, so these productions would have been staged during the day. And so, for example, the storm scene in King Lear, how do you stage that if it's being performed under an open air sky and it's a sunny day and it's supposed to be a rainstorm? So this would be evoked just through the language, the characters saying, you know, wow, some storm we're having. There's some speculation that maybe beneath the stage You'd have technicians maybe buckling some metal or something to make the sound of thunder. And it's all guesses, though, but we think there may have been some special effects involved. And you can see this arched area here. This would have been the staging house over the stage. Pretty good-sized building. I've been there. It's probably about the size of our gym, okay? Maybe, maybe it's somewhat bigger. And this is a photograph from more at the street level. You can see the size of the doors and the people going in. So again, probably at least as big as our gym, good sized building. Shakespeare's Globe Theater burned down um, later in his career in the early 1600s during a production of Henry VIII, I believe. Here's an interior shot. I actually um, got to enjoy a, a presentation by the Royal Shakespeare Theater of King Lear, staged on this stage. And when I was buying my tickets from home before I went to England, uh, the best tickets I could get were on the third tier. And I thought, oh, these are going to be great tickets. However, they were up here. And some of the key action was blocked by this pillar, including the most disturbing scene in the play. And uh, the person I was with didn't know why everyone was wincing, because um, she didn't know the play. But I knew what was going on, and I didn't get to see it because it was blocked. So I was right up there. And the seats, if you go to England and you want to see a play here, just so you know, the seat is a two by six board you're sitting on, and your, your, your knees are right up against someone's back. They really tried to make it like it would be in Shakespeare's day, which is not very comfortable. You'll have a much more comfortable experience if you go to Stratford and actually go to their Royal Shakespeare Theater in Stratford. But this is a... If you're in London, you got to go. 
And for basically a penny, you could be one of the groundlings and stand for the whole two hours and watch the play down here. Um, those were considered the cheap seats. You know, you'd just be standing there. This crowd during a, a staging could get kind of rowdy, especially if they've been drinking for a couple hours. And we, we might guess that there might have been some concessionaires, some, maybe some, some people going through selling ale. I mean, it's, it's possible. Um, but if you were an actor on this stage, you'd have to contend with an with a audience that could be unpredictable. You know? So another view, this would be up from the nosebleed seats, looking straight down. And you can see the balcony, and you'd have entrances on the side back here. And this is as far as we know what the globe would have looked like. There would have been perhaps trap doors for ghosts or witches to make entrances uh, or for technicians to create sounds underneath, we think. You know. Okay, So that's a little bit about what the globe looked like. Problem is in Shakespeare's day, sometimes the plague would be making its way through Europe and the officials would shut down the theaters. And, and there were more than one theater on Southwark. Uh, there was the Rose, there were competing theaters, um, and they would shut them all down if there was an outbreak of plague, because you didn't want people congregating in large groups where they could be more prone to, to transmit it. So if you're an actor for this company and your theater's shut down, what do you do? Well, they would go on tour, and they'd pack up the wagons with their costumes and any props they wanted to take, and they'd hit the road, and they'd go set up at taverns out in the country or out in the more suburban or rural areas, set up in a courtyard, maybe. And if you worked for Shakespeare's company, you would have to have multiple skills. For example, maybe you'd be, maybe you'd be a juggler, and you'd go up maybe the city streets out in the outlying areas and do some juggling so, and, and make some announcements that there's going to be a show that afternoon at such and such tavern. Okay, or maybe you'd be staging some sword play, or maybe you'd know some recitations from some, same, from some, famous, <laughs> from some famous texts. Um, other skills, magic tricks. So knowing sleight of hands, how to make things disappear and do magic. Um, so fencing we talked about, and acrobatics, and singing, because there's a lot of singing in Shakespeare's plays. And of course, you'd have to have a really great oratory voice that could project, because they didn't have you know modern PA equipment. Okay. Um, what was life like if you were to go back to Shakespeare's London? This would be one of the bridges in London, and you can see back in that day they actually built on the bridges, and the houses would go way out over the streets, so. All the streets in London were pretty dark, and people tended to live on the second floor and have their shop on the first floor. So if you were a candle maker, you'd have your little shop down there, and you'd have your little house above it. And people wanted to maximize their square feet, so they'd build out over the street and it'd make the streets really dark. Sewage, you know, if it was liquid, probably got thrown out in the street. If it was solid, probably in a mound out back. There's probably a lot of vermin. Probably not a real nice smelling place back in that time. This is a, a period photo from about 1600. And you can see this would have been a peasant family. And for a, a male at that time, you'd have one shirt. A shirt would cost about the equivalent of a month of pay for me. Okay, so you would own one shirt. Why were clothes so expensive? They were handmade. They didn't have textile mills back then. Every you know, fabric was made from by hand, and uh, the, the the threads to make that fabric was spun by hand, and the clothes were assembled by a tailor per your specifications by hand. A lot of the people back in that time would have been barefoot year round because you had to have pretty good income to be able to afford shoes for your whole family. The most valuable asset for Shakespeare's theater, 
even more than the building itself were the costumes. Okay, the clothing really expensive. Patrons of the theater who were very wealthy would often, um, in their will, bequeath some of their wardrobe to their favorite theater company. So, you know, if there's a wealthy, maybe had an ermine cape that a king could wear or something like that. So the clothing, very expensive. Um, and we, you know, you, as you can imagine, stuff going into the river, sanitation, maybe not that great. So as such, the, the staple beverage for man, woman, and child was ale. We know that um, archaeologically. We, we know that. And typically, it would be the female of the household who would be in charge of brewing the ale. And it's safer to drink ale than the water because ale is cooked. So for the sake of not having all the microorganisms. Um, so you can imagine that um, it could be maybe a drunkenness could maybe be a problem for the population. OK. So we're especially talking in the cities. OK. So now let's, now let's re review a little bit today some of the things we learned about tragedy. And that's just. Let's just call on some of you and see um, what we remember about it. Okay, so why don't I why don't I grab some of the cards here? We got some points. And Jaron, if you want to get the lights, that would be great. If you want to get the lights back on. And and let's go to Hunter. Can you remind us what is Tragedy. I can give you a lot on tragedy. Uh, just what Aristotle said, just for starters, would be great. Uh, imitation of an action with immenses, serious, complete of magnitude, language embellished with artistic ornaments, action not a narrative, incidents are rousing, pity and fear sought to purge. Good. And, and the most problematic part of that definition is. Aristotle, we, we really don't know what he meant. He says, so it's to evoke these emotions of pity and fear so as to create a catharsis of those emotions, a purging. But we, there's a lot of disagreement among scholars about what's really meant by that. So make of that what you will, OK? Does seeing some strikingly tragic thing acted out on stage make you feel better? I don't know. That's for you to decide. Um, let's go to Sarah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the Disoy Logoi are? And, and it is a plural, so I say are. The several conflicted truths. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Let's think about this a little bit. So if you guys really apprehend this concept of the disoi logoi, I would think a lot of you would be disturbed. You're nodding, OK? If, if you have several truths that are in conflict on a given subject, what problem does that raise for us in terms of trying to navigate what's real? You see where that's going? Then, then what's true? If there are several versions of the truth, aren't we taught kind of by how we're modeled things growing up that there's one truth for us to seek out? You know, that truth is out there. We just need to find it. And tragedy pulls that rug out from under us. And that's what we need to understand, OK? So, this notion that somehow there's some absolute truth, and if we just search for it, we can find it and know that truth, is made problematic by the concept of the disoi logoi. That on a given subject, there are at least two or more ex mutually exclusive competing truths to be argued. Okay? So at that point, how does an individual navigate his way through reality? How, how are you to choose which way to go if you don't know what's true? 
or if we feel like we can only see part of the truth. Let's go back to the metaphor of the, uh, or the an analogy of the coin, okay? So the Disloy Logoi teaches us that, yes, there's a truth that we can see, an outwardly visible truth, but it teaches us that just as we see that truth, we must understand there's behind that a hidden truth that we can't see, okay? So how then are we to navigate? This is a key question that tragedy and King Lear, the play, is going to try to answer for us, okay? The Disoi Logoi guarantees that any kind of coherent logic or understanding in life is going to be made problematic, irresolute, conflicted, paradoxical, okay? A paradox is a, a seeming contradiction that can, where both sides of the contradiction can be true at the same time. For example, Macbeth opens up with, when Macbeth walks on the stage, he says, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. So you have this paradox, the first sentence out of Macbeth's mouth is this paradox, you know. Um, it's a fair day, it's a foul day, which is it? Can it be both a fair and a foul day? And as we find out, it, it can. The problem for Macbeth, is, if you ever read that play, is he comes up against paradox after paradox, but can only see one side of the truth. How can only be true one way? All right. um, that, so that presents a huge problem. And the, for the person, the individual, the, the self that we show to the world, if we think of that as a species of truth, okay, then we get into these concepts of the ethos and the daemon. And let's go here to, let's go to Odessa. Help remind us, what's the problem with the ethos? That it's out, outwardly good, so. The, so the ethos is the outwardly known self. How could that be a problem? I'm going to come back to you. Let's go to Olivia. Help us out. What's problematic about the ethos? Well, it's kind of like, it's almost like if you're in and out of persona, like you want to be known as, so that like your inner self is like hidden from everybody. So if you're, like, I feel like if your, your inner self is more vulnerable, or like who you actually are than your outward, outward self is like what you want other people to perceive you as. Perhaps. I think you're kind of building on what Odessa said. One thing I want the class to understand about ethos is that it's unstable, okay? The, the ethos is not fixed, but it's unstable. It's shifting in any given context, okay? And this is problematic, okay? So if the self that you're exhibiting to the rest of period five right now is not the same self that you're going to exhibit with your conf confidant when you're just having a one-on-one -on -one talk with your, your most trusted con confidant or confidant, which is the real self? Now, one could make the argument that they're both real, right? I used the extreme exaggerated example yesterday of uh, the serial killer. Do you remember that? Okay. It's kind of comical, but I mean, such things do happen, do they not? Yeah. You know? Uh, after there's one of these terrible shootings, everyone always tries to talk about, well, how, what did people think about the shooter? You know, were there, were there any signs? You know, were there any, any parts about the person we could predict this could happen, you know? And the, and the truth is, experts say it's, it's almost impossible to predict if someone's gonna go out and do something like that. I mean, we'd have to put everyone in a straitjacket. So, you know, the example yesterday I gave was that, you know, maybe you have someone who's working at a supermarket and it seems affable enough. Everyone sees him as this checker in the market. But at night, he's going out and he's a serial, kind of, that's a pun, get it? Supermarket serial. He's a serial killer. Jumping out of the bushes from the Ohio bike trail, right? And killing poor innocent people every night. 
that's kind of an extreme example, okay? So th the problem with that is his ethos for if you're shopping in, in Vons, his ethos is that he's just this affable grocery checker, right? That's all we see. That's all we no can possibly know him as in that context. But he can look in the mirror when he's private at home shaving and be thinking, ha, 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 if only they knew I, that I'm the serial killer. And his secret makes him feel powerful. And his ethos to himself is that he's a serial killer who's fooling the town. Okay, that's a point I don't want to be lost on you, that you have an ethos to yourself. You have an outwardly known version of yourself that you can see. Okay, and this I don't think we discussed yesterday. Did we? Okay. Now, what will sometimes happen, and we're going to see this in Lear, is that the self you think you are behind it might be another self that you haven't met yet. Maybe there's a person who goes to a party. Not that you guys ever would. I'm not, I'm not suggesting, but maybe, maybe someone out there goes to a party Friday night and they get wasted, right? You know, they, they drink a half a bottle of Jack Daniels. They just get wasted. Know what I mean? And they get so wasted that they go into what, what we call a blackout, okay? Which is they're, they're, they're interacting with people at the party and they're drunk and they're wasted and everyone thinks they're funny for a while. And then they end up passing out, you know, and, and but they're in that blackout, which is to say that person doesn't know, they, they're not going to have any recollection, okay? That's what a blackout is, is being so drunk or wasted that you can't remember the next day what was said or done, okay? And the next morning, the person wakes up, okay? And their friends start calling. It's like, I can't believe what you said to so-and-so. And the person says, what are you talking about? I don't remember. Or the person says, I can't believe what you did when you went up to so-and-so. And, and, and the person starts hearing, and then another friend calls. And they start piecing together the evening that they lost from the computer. And the person says, that wasn't me. I would never do that. But it was you. You have just shaken hands with your daemon. Okay? You have just shaken hands with a hidden, unknown self inside you. Maybe you guys might remember a few years ago, uh, Mel Gibson. Oh my God. He, he got arrested for a DUI and unfortunately he started making a lot of anti-Semitic rants. And he tried to make an amends for that later. And he's, he, he has come out and acknowledged himself as having a problem with alcoholism. Now, this, so this is a problem for him in that his daemon has been made public. So it wasn't just at a party. It's the whole world knows that when, and he, he probably didn't even remember saying some of that stuff. Okay, so one way the daemon works is that there's an internal self inside you waiting to surface. Now, there were a couple times in my journalism career where I got to tour a prison. And if you ever get a chance, maybe when you're in college, to tour one of the prisons, one of the correctional facilities, um, the person who will come out and be your tour guide will be one of the inmates. And both of the times when I toured California Men's Colony, the uh, guide was uh, convicted um, for murder, for homicide. And both times, each of those men seemed very intelligent to me, articulate, um, affable, friendly. And if you met this person in a business or on the street, you would never think that this person had any reason to be behind bars. Okay, so what happens to, I'm not talking about 
you know, the, the gang guys who are going out, or serial killers, or people who have a screw loose. I'm talking about guys who are in there for murder, where their whole life they lived a normal life, and then this one time they snapped and, and killed someone. And there are a lot of guys in there like that, right? Crime of passion, okay? Or you have, you have people there, you have men there, who've done something that they would have, if you had told them that someday you're going to do this, they would have laughed. They said, no, I would never do that. And now they're in prison. Okay, so what happened? Tragedy takes a look at that question. How does this happen? Tragedy takes and puts people in these situations. Do you remember the crossroad from yesterday? Okay, it puts the tragic figure at a crossroad usually under extreme emotional stress where a choice must be made and it's an irrevocable choice. It can't be undone, okay? Now, we still haven't talked really about what tragedy wants to teach us. Do you guys find this a little interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Disturbing maybe? Yeah. It's, you know, it's, I, I'm glad to hear that because I think some of you are, are living really good, clean lives. So let's, um, let's, talk about, let's talk about the theos. So the theos is a Greek word that means the outwardly known side of deity, okay, of God. All right. So the theos is to deity as the ethos is to mortals. Okay, so for the Greeks, for the ancient Greeks, an example of theos would be environmental phenomena. For example, a, a huge storm might be attributed to Zeus trying to demonstrate something. Or a tidal wave might be attributed to Poseidon as we see in the Odyssey, okay. For, uh, for the Hebrews, okay, as you saw in your Old Testament, the, uh, we could say that the burning bush that Moses sees is an example of theos. Or a modern day Christian might say an example of the, the outwardly known side of God would just be the Bible, you know, the, the scriptures, okay? Or reading the gospels, one might say that an example of theos would be an, a particular miracle, you know, that uh, Jesus performs in the gospels. And he performs a lot of them, doesn't he? Okay? So, Daemon is not only the hidden unknown side of a person, but it's also the hidden unknown side of God. So just as behind a person's outwardly seen ethos, we know there's a daemon we haven't met yet, and tragedy assumes this is true of every single person, it also assumes that behind the outwardly visible manifestations of, a, of God. There's another side of God that we can't see. Okay? That's scary. So again, how are you to navigate yourself through a reality? Tr say you're trying to do God's will when you can't fully see both sides of that God's persona, as it were. Okay? You just see what's visible. So tragedy has made for us a real problem with seeing, with eyes, with sight, because our eyes don't see the complete picture, and they can lead us astray. Okay? Now, the Greeks use the word danos to describe the human being, especially the tragic figure. And as you're reading Lear, I want to, you to see, how would you apply the word danos to Goneril, to Regan, to Lear himself, and especially to Cornwall and Edmund, who are the villains of the play. And the Danos is simply a word that means the human monster. Okay? And the human being is seen as a walking paradox. So think of the word paradox if you were going to apply it to an actual human being, the Greek word for that would be Danos. The Danos 
is someone who can control the world around him but cannot control what's in him. The Danos is an agent who makes things happen but upon whom things are acted. The Danos has a very industrious mind, but it's also a mind that will lead him astray. The, da the Danos is equivocal, okay? You don't know who you're dealing with when you're dealing with a human being because they have these two sides to them, which makes them a monster, okay? The Danos is the human version of the disoi logoi, this problem of things being in conflict, of, of truths being in conflict, of what's real being in conflict with itself. Okay. And the Greek tragedy teaches that the Danos is inside every person and the tragic figure is the one who's really going to dramatize that for us. Do I need to clarify that concept further? Where do I need to back up? Okay. So, and we we talked yesterday about the plot as well. We talked about anonoresis, a sudden revelation of what's been hidden. I would throw in the word shocking. So it's a sudden and shocking disclosure of some truth that's been hidden. In the case of Oedipus, it really happens at the end of the first play where we see Oedipus realizes who he is. His wife sees it a little bit sooner, doesn't she? His wife slash mother. She's, she's, she's maybe a little bit better at putting things together, Yocasta, isn't she? She hears this messenger from Corinth with this ostensibly great news. Hey, you know that the curse from the oracle never came true. Your father dies of natural causes. And then, of course, we know that someone there in Thebes recognizes this guy and they start talking, right? And, and as they begin saying a few things to each other, Oedipus starts pushing them for more details as Yocasta tries to put the brakes on that. No, let it be. She sees what's going on. So the moment of anonoresis is the moment of knowledge for Oedipus, the knowledge of who he is. Okay. So as you're reading Shakespeare, one exercise for you is to pinpoint where does the anonoresis happen. If you could pick one, one spot in the play. Here's where the plot hinges on this disclosure of what's been hidden. And there's a lot of stuff hidden. It could happen multiple times, okay, in terms of Lear, in terms of Edmund, in terms of the sisters, as you're reading, okay. We also talked about peripatia which is a sudden reversal of intention or of fortune. And as I said yesterday, Oedipus epitomizes this concept because literally within a moment, Oedipus goes from being an adored king, a, a trusted king. The supplicants come and ask him to save them and help them. He goes from being that to being the most loathed man in, in all of literature, right? At that moment, and it happens at the same moment of revelation, of disclosure, which makes it a perfect play for Aristotle, okay? So let's get to this term hubris, okay? Who has an understanding of that term? Who can help us out? Rose. Good. I like that. Yeah. I don't know if you got on the video, so I'll just kind of repeat what you said. So Rose was saying that hubris has to do with a flaw in, the, in a human's nature. And in, in Oedipus, we see it as a flaw of pride. We do see Oedipus is very proud, isn't he? Yes. Uh, we see other flaws in him as well. I think um, he's very impulsive. I think he's very, I think he's paranoid. I think he's quick to anger. Um, I think that it has to do a lot with how somebody outthink or outsmart or trying or thinking they can outsmart like the gods and Greeks. Excellent. Okay, so this concept of um, hubris we see it in Laius 
when he first gets the prophecy, don't we? So let's abandon the baby up on Mount Scytheron. Let's get rid of this bad juju here, this bad mojo, right? Let's abandon him to the gods. Let's give him back. And in, in other words, he's trying to subvert. Now, do you guys understand the will of the gods? Back in the, for the ancient Greeks, you have this thing called fate, right? And between fate and the mortals, there are these people known as the gods, or not people, but these deities. So, and, they're, and they have a job. The gods have a job to make sure that someone's prescribed fate comes, comes to be. And it's up to the gods to decide how that's going to be. Okay? So the gods actually have a responsibility. So for Elias to try to skirt around what the oracle said, not only shows a lapse in his faith, but also shows him trying to outwit the gods. And that is a good example of hubris right there. Okay? Let's build on that. So we're also talking about someone who could purport to know what's the right path of action, the right thing to say or do on his own without consulting the gods. Okay, now we do see in Oedipus, we see these characters going to the oracle and asking for prophecies. The problem is they don't like what they hear and they try to do that end run around them. Okay, but it's, it would also be a problem if you try to do some big decision without consulting the gods, period. That would be an example of hubris. Okay, so make a note of that. So it's, it's the hubris is not just inflated pride. I mean, yes, it's inflated pride, but it goes a step beyond that. It's, it's having a, a, the belief in oneself that you have enough information to make a good decision in a world where you can't see the whole picture. We live in a box of space and time. We, we are in this box of finite temporal reality. Out there, outside the box, is eternity and infinity. We can't see eternity. We can't see infinity. So the mortal who really wants to make a good decision should channel some advice from those who can see eternity and affinity, right? You with me? Am I losing you here on that? So, and it's tempting to do that. You know, something looks a certain way. Here's how it appears to be. So what's, what should, what's a person to do? If you don't know, the gods haven't revealed to you Maybe you don't have an oracle around the block you can go consult. You don't, you know, you don't know the whole picture. What's a person should, what should you do? Pray. Ask the gods for guidance. If the guidance isn't forthcoming, sit on your hands. Wait for more to be revealed. Have a sense of your own lack of sufficiency to your own inefficacy in, in being able to navigate a world that's so problematic. Okay? Be skeptical of what appears to be. Okay? Because... And then, right, we're close to finishing here. Let's, let's um, leave it with this. Okay, so above all, tragedy is going to try to teach us this lesson. This is why Oedipus takes his own eyes out at the end of the first Oedipal play. His eyes have utterly failed him. He couldn't even see who he himself was, let alone his wife or the circumstances beyond that immediacy. He couldn't see how he himself was making the very prophecy he was trying to avert to come true. And it's, it's really ironic, isn't it? 
that his very attempt to avert that truth actually made that truth happen. Okay? That's, Shakespeare's going to play with that same irony okay, in his tragedies. So there's a problem with seeing. There's a problem with appearances. Pay attention in Act 1 and Act 2 this week as you're reading King Lear to how Shakespeare is going to play with this problem. Shakespeare, I love assigning Shakespeare to my students because I think he's a, a, a really keen scholar of Greek tragedy. Shakespeare understood these concepts, as you'll see. So where, where do I need to back up? What questions do you have at this point? We feeling good about tragedy? We, okay. All right. I want to thank our videographer, Quinn.